Uh, we are here to discuss uh, the shooting and death of Nathan Giffen on January 16th, 2018, uh, in the city of Montpelier. Uh, we've come to the conclusion, and I rule today, that the shooting and death of Nathan Giffen uh, was justified. Therefore, there will be no criminal charges filed against any of the police officers involved in the shooting. Uh, I spoke to Nathan Giffen's father uh, last night, uh, offered my condolences, and informed him of my decision. Uh, the video uh, from uh, the cr cruiser camera uh, will be distributed to members of the media at the conclusion of the press conference uh, today. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to the chief of our criminal division, Bram Tronickfeld, uh, to uh, do a factual recitation. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Bram Kronickfeld, I'm the Chief of the Criminal Division of the Attorney General's Office. On January 16th, 2018, Burlington resident Nathan Giffen was fired upon by police officers resulting in his death. These officers included Vermont State Police Troopers Lyle Decker, Corey Lozier, Eugene Duplissis, Christopher Brown, Charlie Wynn, David White, Isaac Merriam, Brandon Degree, and Montpelier Police Officer Michael Philbrick. The relevant facts surrounding the shooting are as follows. At approximately 9.34 a.m. on January 16, 2018, employees at the Vermont State Employees Credit Union located in Montpelier, Vermont, reported an armed robbery to 911. Callers described the perpetrator as an armed male wearing all black. Dispatch received subsequent reports that he was running on a nearby bicycle path while dropping U.S. currency. Montpelier Police Department, or MPD, Corporal Matthew Nisley heard this dispatch while located at Montpelier High School, where he was a school resource officer. He immediately located a suspect matching this description, who was later identified as Nathan Giffen. Corporal Nisley communicated via radio that the suspect was wearing a black sweatshirt and black pants and was running towards liquor control. MP MPD dispatchers and officers alerted Montpelier High School and the nearby Department of Liquor Control of the situation. Montpelier High School remained on lockdown throughout the incident while Liquor Control Investigator Mike Welch responded to assist Corporal Nisley. After observing Mr. Giffen running on foot, Corporal Nisley began to follow him in his marked MPD squad car equipped with lights, sirens, and a dash cam video. Corporal Nisley drove onto the bicycle path where he had seen Mr. Giffen and was able to locate him running from the baseball diamond toward the athletics field at Montpelier High School. Corporal Nisley exited his vehicle, unholstered his firearm, and began to pursue Mr. Giffen on foot. Corporal Nisley observed Mr. Giffen throwing U.S. currency out of a plastic bag as he ran. Corporal Nisley verbally ordered Mr. Giffen to stop, but Mr. Giffen continued to move away. At this point, Corporal Nisley observed that it appeared Mr. Giffen was holding a handgun and reported this over the radio. Corporal Nisley commanded Mr. Giffen to drop the weapon and get onto the ground. Mr. Giffen did not comply. Mr. Giffen responded to Corporal Nisley, you're going to have to shoot me or I'm gonna shoot you. When Mr. Griffin stated this, Corporal Nisley took cover behind a light pole located near the north corner of the field between a green equipment shed and bleachers and continued to attempt to convince Mr. Giffen to drop his weapon. Mr. Giffen responded, I'm not going back to jail, so something's going to happen. Mr. Giffen then walked to the bleachers, which were approximately 35 feet southeast of the equipment shed, where he remained and alternated between sitting down and pacing. At approximately 9.50 a.m., MPD began requesting assistance from nearby police departments, the Vermont State Police Crisis Negotiation Unit and Tactical Services Unit. Corporal Nisley continued to speak with Mr. Giffen. Mr. Giffen began crossing himself and made statements such as, I'm gonna shoot you or you're gonna shoot me. Tell my girl she's too good for me and tell my dad I'm sorry. Mr. Giffen also made demands and set deadlines such as, if you don't give me a cigarette in a minute, this is gonna go. And are you guys ready? We're gonna rock and roll. While Corporal Nisley was speaking with Mr. Giffen, Liquor Control Investigator Mike Welch approached and began to assist. Both officers were armed with handguns. Neither were equipped with cold weather gear and only Corporal Nisley was equipped with a soft ballistic vest. 
Investigator Welch and Corporal Nisley took cover behind the green wooden equipment shed on the north corner of the field, approximately 100 feet from Mr. Giffen's location. At approximately 10 o'clock a.m., Corporal Nisley reported over the radio that when Mr. Giffen had first been running, he was carrying what appeared to be a real firearm that was out of battery. Corporal Nisley also reported that his radio was beginning to run low on power and he would be unable to remain in audio contact. Throughout the incident, Montpelier Police Department officers utilized a recorded and monitored radio frequency. Corporal Nisley utilized this frequency to relay information about his interactions with Mr. Giffen. This frequency was not monitored by VSP Tactical Services troopers who were communicating on their own non-recorded channel. Corporal Nisley and Investigator Welch continued engaging in conversation with Mr. Giffen while other law enforcement officers began establishing a perimeter around the area. MPD Corporal Michael Philbrick, armed with a rifle, and Washington County Sheriff's Deputy James Wells, equipped with binoculars, took up positions on the southeast corner of the field. Mr. Giffen asked Investigator Welch if he had children. When Investigator Welch responded that he did, Mr. Giffen requested to speak with a police officer who did not have children. Corporal Nisley reported this over the MPD radio channel, which was heard by MPD Corporal Philbrook and relayed to VSP Trooper Brandon Degree. At approximately 10.05 a.m., VSP Trooper Isaac Merriam, armed with a shotgun, took up a position on the south side of the athletics field and heard some communication between Mr. Giffen and Corporal Nisley, including Mr. Giffen saying, I'm not going back. Other officers with the Vermont State Police, including the Tactical Services Unit, began arriving at approximately 10:10 10, 10 a.m. and had established positions around the athletics field by approximately 10:30 a.m. VSP sergeants Charles Wynn, Eugene Duplissis, David White, Lyle Decker, Trooper Christopher Brown, and others took positions on the southwest corner of the athletics field between 224 and 291 feet of Mr. Giffen's location. These officers were all armed with rifles and were informed that Mr. Giffen had recently committed an armed bank robbery. These officers all reported seeing Mr. Giffen gesturing with a firearm and engaging in conversation with police officers who were taking cover behind a shed. Sergeant Duplissis also recalled hearing that Mr. Giffen had threatened police officers with violence. VSP Trooper Brandon Negree and MPD Corporal Michael Philbrick maintained their positions on the southeast corner of the field approximately 575 to 600 feet from Mr. Giffen's location. These officers were armed with rifles. VSP Sergeant Corey Lozier, the ranking tactical services officer on the scene, arrived at approximately 10.35 a.m. Sergeant Lozier observed Mr. Giffen engaging in dialogue with Investigator Welch, who was still taking cover behind the equipment shed. Sergeant Lozier began moving east along the riverbank to maintain cover while moving closer to Investigator Welch to assist him. At approximately 10.40 a.m., Mr. Giffen began to move from the bleachers to the northwest half of the athletics field while continuing to engage in conversation with Investigator Welch and Corporal Nisley. As Sergeant Lozier got closer to the equipment shed, he observed Corporal Nisley also taking cover there. Corporal Nisley stated to Sergeant Lozier that he was glad the tactical services unit was there as his hands were going numb. He also told Sergeant Lozier that the suspect's name was Nate. Sergeant Lozier took up a position on the north side of the bicycle path west of the shed. During this time, Sergeant Lozier and the other officers observed Mr. Giffen speaking in an anim animated manner, often flailing his arms, pacing, gesturing with the weapon, and at times pointing the muzzle of the weapon in the direction of Corporal Nisley and Investigator Welch. At around this time, Department of Liquor Control Sergeant C. Martin Prevost heard Mr. Giffen state, this is going to end, I've waited long enough, someone's not going home. At approximately 11 o'clock a.m., Mr. Giffen threw off the hood he was wearing and began to move from the athletics field north towards the shed in the direction of Sergeant Lozier and the other two officers. Upon approaching the shed, Mr. Giffen began to move around the structure while looking towards where the officers were taking cover. Sergeant Lozier had the following dialogue with Mr. Giffen during this time. Sergeant Lozier, what can we do to res resolve this peacefully? Mr. Giffen, nothing. Do you have a cigarette? Lozier, I don't. Put the gun down, Nate. Giffen, absolutely not. I'm not putting this gun down for nothing. Do what you got to do. Lozier, Nate, we all want this to end peacefully. Can you put the gun down for me? Mr. Giffen, absolutely not. I'm not putting this down. Mr. Giffen continued moving around the shed where Corporal Nisley and Investigator Welch were taking cover 
advancing toward where Sergeant Lozier was positioned. Sergeant Lozier observed Mr. Giffen glancing at Corporal Nisley's nearby police cruiser, which was running. Sergeant Lozier ordered Mr. Giffen to stop advancing and to drop the gun, to which Mr. Giffen did not respond. When Mr. Giffen was approximately 92 feet from Sergeant Lozier and approximately 70 feet from Corporal Nisley and Investigator Welch, Sergeant Lozier fired one shot with his rifle, which struck Mr. Giffen in the chest. Trooper, Trooper Christopher Brown assessed the same threat and fired his rifle four times in the direction of Mr. Giffen. Upon being struck by Sergeant Lozier's shot, Mr. Giffen dropped his weapon and fell to his knees. Mr. Giffen then retrieved the weapon he had dropped and pointed it in the direction of the shed. At this point, Sergeants Charles Wynn, Eugene Duplissis, David White, and Trooper Isaac Merriam began to fire towards Mr. Giffen. These, these troopers fired a total of 15 to 17 rounds. From the time that Sergeant Lozier discharged his firearm to when these troopers ceased firing, approximately 10 seconds had elapsed. After approximately another 17 seconds, Mr. Giffen again raised the weapon, pointed it in the direction of the shed, and was shot a single time by MPD Corporal Michael Philbrick. Following the shooting, tactical services, service officers approached Mr. Giffen and gave him verbal commands to throw the gun. Tactical service officers placed Mr. Giffen in handcuffs and attempted to administer first aid. An ambulance arrived shortly after, and paramedics began administering aid while transporting Mr. Giffen to the Central Vermont Medical Center in Berlin, Vermont. Mr. Giffen was pronounced dead at 11.47 a.m. A medical examiner determined that Mr. Giffen's cause of death was wife, rifle wounds. He was shot a total of seven times. Two shots entered Mr. Giffen's chest and abdomen, respectively, and five shots penetrated portions of Mr. Giffen's legs, thighs, and buttocks. The examination of Mr. Giffen's weapon revealed that it was an Umarex 40 XP blowback BB pistol capable of firing steel BBs using pressurized gas. Generally, an individual may use deadly force if he reasonably believes that he or another is in imminent danger of death or serious bodily harm and that the use of such force is necessary to avoid this danger. In analyzing the facts as set forth earlier against these standards, criminal charges against the officers at issue are not supported by the evidence for the following reasons. At the time of the shooting, Mr. Giffen was armed with what appeared to be a firearm. Second, Mr. Giffen had just committed an armed robbery of a nearby credit union. Third, at the time of the shooting, Mr. Giffen was near a running police vehicle and on the property of a high school in session. Fourth, Mr. Giffen was heard making verbal threats by Sergeant Lozier and Trooper Isaac Merriam. Corporal Michael Philbrick, Trooper Brandon Degree, and Sergeant Eugene Duplissis were aware that he had made verbal threats towards officers. Fifth, throughout the incident, Mr. Giffen gestured with what appeared to be a firearm and at times pointed the muzzle in the direction of police officers. Six, immediately prior to being fired upon, Mr. Giffen advanced towards officers who were taking cover and ignored verbal commands to stop. Seven, immediately prior to being fired upon, Mr. Giffen reasonably appeared to be moving into a position where he could engage Corporal Nisley, Investigator Welch, and Sergeant Lozier. Given Mr. Giffen's actions and behavior as stated above, a reasonable person would have believed that Mr. Giffen presented an imminent threat of death or a serious bodily injury to Investigator Welch, Corporal Nisley, and Sergeant Lozier. Therefore, Sergeant Lozier's and Trooper Brown's acts of firing at Mr. Giffen were justified. After being initially struck, Mr. Giffen retrieved his weapon, raised it, and pointed it towards the shed behind which police officers were taking cover. Six Vermont State Police Troopers fired on him at this point. Mr. Giffen's actions at this point, in the context of his prior actions, would lead a reasonable person to believe that the imminent threat to the police officers had not yet abated, and therefore the troopers' actions of firing at this time were justified. Mr. Giffen raised his weapon a third time and pointed it towards the shed when MPD Corporal Michael Philbrick fired a single shot at Mr. Giffen. This action, observed in the context of Mr. Giffen's prior actions, would lead a reasonable person to believe that the imminent threat to the police officers had not yet abated, therefore the action of firing at this time was justified. For these reasons, the Attorney General's Office will not be filing charges against the Vermont State Police Troopers or Montpelier Police Department officer for their actions in this incident and absent the receipt of additional and material information 
or evidence considers this re review to be concluded.